Yeah, Mark, I wanted to ask you, even though you took a stand for workers' rights, I mean, that was what you were doing. You were taking a stand for workers' rights. You've been wrongfully demeaned and even threatened as a union buster. The union that was supposed to protect and represent you turned against you simply because you were standing for the fundamental constitutional right to free speech. Can you share with us about that experience? What what happened and how did it affect you and your family, the the backlash? Can you describe what what happened and, and, and its impact on you guys? Well, uh, initially, I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. Uh, I didn't even <laughs> tell my own mother um, because, you know, I didn't, number one, I didn't know what kind of backlash I would I would receive, mm. if any, and I knew there probably would be. Uh, and not knowing the outcome of what was going to happen, uh, there's no point in making a big deal out of it, and, and then you get disappointed. But at the time that the uh, petition uh, went to the Supreme Court, and then they uh, accepted it and said they would hear the case, well, that was all over the news on a national basis. So it was a little hard to keep it quiet at that point. So that's when, you know, the the union really got on my case, uh, you know, with uh, news articles, uh, all kinds of op-ed pieces, et cetera, et cetera. And the people at work, um, it, that was surprising because even though they didn't overtly uh, come out, but I could tell by looks, I could tell by you know, people that just that I used to talk to all the time now just wouldn't even speak to me. I'd have people that I'd meet in the hallway and they'd kind of brush up against me, you know, like, eh, you bum, you know, type of thing. And, you know, so it was, you know, they, they thought I was, I was basically a pariah is what it boiled down to. And kind of an interesting uh, sidebar to that is that uh, I eventually did tell my mother I was going to the Supreme Court. I was handling this case. And of course, uh, she, you know, pondered that for a second. And then she said, you know what, um, Mark, you know what they did to Jimmy Hoffa? Oh, <laughs> that's comforting. <laughs> you know, yeah. And I said, well, you know, thanks for the support. Uh, of course, my, my two children were very much in, in you know, support and, and said that, uh, you know, they supported me, of course, and the like, but they were somewhat concerned. Uh, but I, I kept their names totally quiet uh, and my whole family totally quiet uh, because, you know, obviously I didn't want anybody coming af after them and the like. Uh, so there was a time also uh, during this process when, uh, you know, I had a, a, a lady come to my house and she put a post-it note on my door in the middle of the night. It was like 2 or 3 a.m. Uh, and it said, I told you we knew where you lived. And of course, I, we, we know that it was a lady and it was the time because I had installed some security cameras at the front door, the back door and a security system. And we went back and replayed the tape, went to the authorities and they said, well, we really can't do anything because uh, you didn't have any no trespassing signs up. Uh, so you're kind of on your own in that regard. But that was mm -hmm. the only thing that happened then. Of course, there was a couple other instances after the court decision came down in my favor that, uh, you know, things got a little more ugly uh, in that regard. How did it get more ugly? Well, after the decision, uh, I was in New Mexico, uh, you know, talking to people and trying to promote what's now known as Janus Rights. Um, and I found out that there was a gentleman up in the state of Washington that had posted on Facebook that uh, he proposed that somebody ought to go out and try to kill me. Um, and he did not get any takers on it. So he posted again and said, well, I guess I'll have to do it myself. And after I do, I think I'm going to eat his brains uh, because I bet you they taste good. Well, obviously, this guy was, um, you know, not. Uh, totally all there. So the FBI got involved and, and the, eventually the gentleman was arrested and so on. But he'd also made threats against uh, uh, Trump at the time and, and other public officials. So it, he wasn't singling me out, but it was still very disturbing nonetheless. Of course.
Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. I imagine that wasn't the only death threats you got. Um, no, there, well, if there were others, I'm not aware of them. Um, and, you know, but I, I think the, the union knew that if anything did happen to me physically or otherwise, mm. um, quite frankly, would probably go against them in a big way, um, in, in a very negative way. So I think they kind of put the word out to, you know, lay off mm -hmm. any kind of physical threats or other types of threats. Um, and they mainly did it through, you know, newspaper, media, uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, can so, we follow up? I want to move to something a little bit more light. Yeah, that was the downside was, of it. That was tough. Everyone um, knows taking a stand comes at a cost. But... Yeah, but they don't, they often don't see the cost or hear about the cost. They hear the, the sort of the heroic side of the story, right? The happy ending, so to speak, but they don't, they don't often hear what it took to get there. And that's mm -hmm. why it was important to ask those questions. And thank you, Mark, for being so, so open about it. Um, what was it like, uh, you know, when you got to the, to the Supreme Court? Tell, tell us a, a little bit about that. Well, when I, when I actually got to the Supreme Court, um, you know, of course, there were, when we walked in, there was lots of, you know, protesters and, and others, uh, not a large amount, but, but some. And um, quite frankly, it was just overwhelming. Um, you know, here I am walking into the Supreme Court building as a plaintiff in a, in a lawsuit and going into the courtroom, uh, which is packed um, because every time the court has oral, or oral arguments, uh, you know, lots of attorneys, lots of media and, and the like. Um, and here I was introduced to the governor of Illinois. I was introduced to Betsy DeVos, Secretary of Education mm -hmm. um, and other notables. Uh, and quite frankly, it was just overwhelming. Uh, and, but when Justice Roberts called my case uh, to hear your name, called by the <laughs> chief justice uh, of the Supreme Court is, is just kind of blows your mind, if you will. Um, and then as the arguments proceeded, when you hear the arguments back and forth, and, and let me clarify something, a lot of people, four people, the Supreme Court, when they hear a case, it's more like a debate. It's not what you see on Law and Order or some of these other TV shows. Um, the uh, you know, my attorney would get up and make some presentation. He would be interrupted, uh, you know, by a justice and asked a question. Um, he would then continue his remarks and, and then maybe another justice would interrupt. And, and we go that way on both sides. Uh, they would interrupt the union side. They would interrupt my side. And it's, it's a debate. It's back and forth and back and forth. Um, quite fascinating, really, but also very much a blur. That's the beauty of our republic at work. You know, ha there's all, there's those two sides of the story, two positions on something. People in a in an orderly, uh, respectful way debate the issues, and the justices listen, ask probing questions. Then they debate amongst themselves. They argue amongst themselves, and then they draft their opinions with their justifications for them. I mean, it's. For me, it's just a it's a beautiful process when you see justice work out in that way, even if the outcomes aren't always what we might want them to be in a particular case. Um, it's yeah, part there's of what dignity in process. Yeah. So, Mark, we know that you're not a lawyer, and there's a lot of debate about all this. However, you are pretty close to the case, and you've lived this out. What's your take on what the court decided in this 5-4 ruling? Well, I think what what they decided and and the the main point is that if you are a union member, you give up your First Amendment rights to that union and to that authority and the uh, administration or the officers of that union. And they speak on your behalf. If you are not a member of the union, you retain those First Amendment rights you can speak for yourself and you can make your own decisions. And that is the basic 
context of the case that each individual employee, worker, whatever you want to call yourself, you have that right to make your own decision. However, once you become a member of a union, you lose that right. You give it up. And that's why in the decision that uh, Justice Alito wrote, he said, um, you must be given the ability to make that decision for yourself. And it has to be declarative. It has to be clear. Uh, mm. And you have to be informed of your rights. Now, now as an example, uh, we're all familiar with Miranda rights. Uh, I mean, if an individual is arrested, they are read their rights. Well, why is it when a new hire goes into a government office, why is it that they're not given the same rights, such as what's now I known as Janus rights? Why are they not given those rights? Just and like your many, point when you said, yeah. I didn't realize I ever gave that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so that is the the only thing that is there. 